Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Unpacking Possibility. I'm your host, Tracy Stein. As always, I'm so happy to be here with you today. And my guest is someone you're really going to enjoy, someone different from anyone I've ever had on the podcast. And her name is Anna Kloka. She is a pet communicator and pet medium. And we'll get into a little bit more about what that is and all of the wonderful things she can do to help connect us more deeply and accurately and instinctively and intuitively with our beloved animals. I'm also joined by my cat, Princess. So I'm so excited for this episode today. So Anna, I want to um, welcome you. I am so happy you could make time for this today. I know you're a very busy lady. I was going to introduce you, but I think I would like you to introduce you because you've got such an interesting journey. Hi, Tracy. Good morning. Um, Thank you for having me here. I'm very excited to talk about animal communication because it's my passion and very dear to my heart. So like you said, I'm an intuitive animal communicator, pet medium and Reiki practitioner. I love it. Such a wonderful combination. Tell me a little bit about your journey because you didn't start out communicating with animals formally, but you've really had this ability to connect with them your whole life, it sounds like. So I I think I was always very intuitive, but mostly I had connection with the spirit world. I saw some people in spirit here and there. I didn't pay much attention to them. They never really scare me. But growing up in Poland, no one really talked about the spirit world or intuition back then. And I didn't have any experience with animals until one of my dogs passed. Actually, I lost three of my dogs in a very short time. And first of the dog who passed away was my dear girl, Ozzy. She was a Polish lowland sheepdog. Very smart, very funny, stubborn, beautiful too. (laughs) Uh, She was also a best of breed Westminster winner. I wow. was I was showing her, so yes, we were quite a team, and I think everyone can relate. We can have many, many animals, but there is always the one that is special, that is just very dear to our heart, and Ozzy was the one. She passed when she was seven years old, very young, very unexpected. I brought her to the vet and practically at the same day, I had to say goodbye to her. She had cancer in her nose and her throat and I was devastated. I was in shock. I was devastated. I blame myself because how could I not see anything? Why didn't I notice that she was ill? But of course, at that time, I didn't know the animals choose the way they come to our life and also how they leave us. So I was grieving for a very long time. I, I She was just very special <laughs> to me and I couldn't understand why it happened so quickly. And then after some time, I stopped seeing Ozzy here and there and I could hear her barking. She was always very, very vocal dog. So I recognized the bark. But I didn't know exactly what was happening, what was going on. And I couldn't control it in any way. I couldn't see her when I want her. I couldn't talk to her or anything. Everything was on Aussie terms. And at that time, I didn't know that she was working very, very hard with me for showing me my passion to for showing me my path in life. And it took her quite quite some time, a few years until I connect the dots. I'm very moved by what you're saying, as you can imagine, um, you know, having loved a lot of animals, like you said, they're all special. And there are some that you have especially close bond with. It's almost hard to, I find it's almost hard for me to describe the relationship. And it sounds like Ozzy was meant to be one of your teachers. Yes, definitely she was. Yeah. And still is. <laughs> <laughs> I believe it. So I know that you grew up in Poland, you moved to Germany, and then you moved to Massachusetts, Mm -hmm. and that's where you are now. And along that journey, you always had your passion and love for animals. You had these budding communications with Ozzy. 
you had your other intuitive gifts that had revealed themselves to you early on. Tell me about the path that you followed to learn animal communication more formally. And also, if you could describe for our listeners, what is animal communication specifically? Because I find that a lot of times when I say, oh, we've used a pet communicator many times, um, people think that the pet has to be there or that it's more like an animal behaviorist looking at, you know, what the pet's doing. And it's like, no, you're actually having very accurate conversations with animals who are either still in a physical body or who passed on. Thank you. So I think the official explanation of animal communication will be intuitive, telepathic, interspecies communication. But I truly believe it's a heart-to-heart, soul-to-soul communication with animals, with our pets, with the wildlife surrounding us. And it's a little bit different to communicate with animals than we are doing now. Like people communicate and speak. For me, it's exchanging, sending and receiving images, feelings, emotions. And I'm mainly clairvoyant, which means I receive a lot of images. And sometimes there are a lot of details. Sometimes they are very subtle And I really have to pay attention what I'm seeing in my mind eye. And the images come very quickly. So I can not really stop them. Sometimes I get a movie. I cannot rewind. I cannot stop and rewatch it. I really have to pay attention what is coming immediately. I also clear sentience, which I feel in my body. And that's the key for me I think because I really have to pay attention like what hurts what I'm feeling if this is a fear or the happiness and I or I have pain or the discomfort and where is in the body and that's coming from the animal and I don't have to see the animal I don't have to see picture I don't have to be present with you or your pet I connect energetically so my intention is to connect with this particular pet, I take some time to connect and then we start the conversation. And you don't even necessarily need a photo to do that. Sometimes I know that can be helpful, but you have actually, when we first spoke, and I'll tell the background about that in a second, you just said, don't tell me anything, you know, tell me the pet's name. And you said, don't tell me anything else. And you described, you know, the accurately with my different pets, the appearance, the personality, but also things that are just not Googleable at all. Like the history of how they came to us, their life before they were with us, and even things that were going on in their bodies that their vets had not yet picked up, that actually turned out to be true. So I just want to clarify that for people, because I think a lot of people who are unfamiliar with this are thinking, well, there has to be an earthly way of getting this information. And there really isn't. Like just by connecting with the energy. And like you said, I don't want to see picture. I don't want to know any information. I feel like if I know too much or that I know anything about the animal or the, the person, then I'm not sure if that's my intuition talking or my brain. So I prefer to work like an artist with a white empty canvas and then pick up the information. If you send me a picture, I already know something or that I might be misled. You know, if you send me a picture of of a German Shepherd, some people have already idea about the breed, but it doesn't have to match the personality. So that's why I prefer not to know anything. I really respect that. And I I feel like just doing other psychic work, to me, I find it's helpful to not know so that there's not any of that noise or our own filters getting in the way. So it makes perfect sense. Now, tell me, tell me, Anna, are you connecting to the pet through the energy of the person who is saying, I want you to connect with my pet so-and-so? Or are you connecting the minute they say it, it's like a line, like almost like a telephone number to the pet? I, as you know, I connect with the person too, because very often the relationship with the person and the animal explain a lot what's going on but I do feel like I connect with the pet directly however the person need to be open to receive the information 
So I think there is some some connection in there, but I mainly focus on the uh, on the animal. I want to share with listeners one of the several communications that we've had, and and um, something you mentioned before, just to give people a heads up. You didn't know anything about me until I sent you the information and said, I want you to be on the podcast. And you, there were all these links where you could look up the podcast and me. So, you know, I was just another person booking an appointment um, for you to meet my pets. And one of them, Princess, is in the room now. Normally, I don't let her <laughs> in the room <laughs> when I'm trying to record something because it's a little distracting. But um, you read Princess early on. We've had Princess not even a year, but we moved to a new house a few years ago. Princess, not long after, started coming to our back patio regularly in in the freezing cold, in the rain, everything. And at first we thought she was stray. Um, So we took her in, took her to the vet. Um, We were calling her Sweet Pea. (laughs) To make a long story short, we found out that she was a neighbor's cat, a neighbor we hadn't yet met. Um, And it was a long journey um, because they kept bringing her in and she kept running out the door and coming to the patio, even when it was counterintuitive because she had actually a much nicer home, <laughs> um, you know, and plenty of people to kind of attend to her. And she came over even when the weather was awful. And you would think no living being would want to be outside. Um, and this went on for, I'm going to say, a good year, year and a half. And to make a long story short, you were able to tune in not only to Princess about what was going on from Princess's perspective in her home. And many of the things, pretty much everything you said was later corroborated because I did get to speak with the people. And you tuned into the fact down the future, which was maybe beyond what Princess might know, you felt she would become our cat and they were not ready to give her to us. You also tuned in accurately to what was going on in her body. And, you know, when we took her to the vet, it was clear um, that she wasn't feeling well. So I, I realize I'm being a little light on some of the details because I want to protect Princess's privacy <laughs> and her previous owner's privacy. But, you know, that was all with just here's a cat. Her name is Princess. Tell us what you see. And you described even her eyes, which tend to be a little bit half closed looking and her kind of small size um, and her coloring. So we didn't need to, and this was not a cat I had posted about all over Instagram either. Anyway, long-winded story, but that's what the experiences are. I think when we have connected and, and generally when you connect with people, you pick up on things that wouldn't be discernible through normal means. Thank you. I, I appreciate. I really enjoy what I do, and and it's, it's my passion. And thank you for the feedback. You always give me great feedback. <laughs> thank you for telling the story. No, not at all. And you know, I mean, I've referred a few neighbors to you, and and one woman, you know, you, her dog. And I don't know anything about her dog. I don't know what it looks like, and I don't know the neighbor well. But she was very moved by your reading because you connected with her dog who had passed away. And she said, wow, Anna really got the personality, you know, and all these details. And it was very healing for her because her, her grief over the passing of this little dog, you know, had remained. Yeah. It was always difficult for people. And I think I give them some hope then we can connect with the pets who passed on. And that's possible. That's what I'm doing. And I really enjoy this part too, because I I don't want to say I heal people, but give them a comfort. And the way I always try to explain how they can communicate, how they can connect, or the what, how to look for a sign and recognize the sign. So... It's very important, I think, for the grieving and healing process of losing a pet. Absolutely. You know, I something I, I've always wanted people to understand myself, and I'm not an animal communicator. I've had many instances of communicating and picking up on things with my own animals and other animals, but I am not a communicator. I'm not where you are. I don't think that's my path. But, you know, something that I've known from you know, my own feelings and working with you and working with other pet communicators. I want to give a shout out to Shalini Bosby-Shell, who is a a close friend and we used for years. And we actually found 
you because Shalini wasn't available when my cat Sebastian ran out and was missing for two days. Um, and I feel like it's just a blessing to have expanded you know, our world and for us to have made a connection. Um, but one thing I've always felt that people don't get about animals is that they have different personalities and a perspective that is kind of, I don't want to say it's human, but in the way that we as people are, you know, we're not one just homogeneous group, <laughs> you know, neither are animals. Um and I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about that, because I'm I'm thinking a lot of times people, even who love their animals, they're maybe I'm thinking like a psychologist too much, but they they see them as objects, objects that are good or bad, pleasing or not pleasing, rather than seeing them from the inside out, you know, in this really empathic way. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about what you've noticed from animals or what you have found that animals want us to know yeah definitely they all have very different personalities they are like us people they are introvert extrovert you know and sometimes we people tend to push our animals in situation they might not feel comfortable and i think we really need to respect this they all need space they all need to be acknowledged for who they are what personality they have and also I think what people should know is like how in tune they are with our emotion. That's always amazed me because if there is something happening, weird behavior or undesired behavior with our animals, and of course there is no any medical reason for that behavior, there's always connection with us. And I encourage people to look inside what is happening with your emotion. What are you dealing with? What are you fighting what you don't like or what you're not talking about because very often the animal will will show us like let's say you clean your house you prepare because the family is coming coming other friends are staying over weekend and then your cat go and pee on the guest bed and everyone will be upset and the first thing we do is blame the cat but if the cat is healthy and there is no problem, I encourage to look inside. Like, how do you feel about the company coming? Are you happy they are staying in your home? <laughs> are you excited seeing them? Or there is your cat saying like, hey, you don't like them. I don't like either what you are feeling. And people don't connect those two, you know. I love that you use that example because I, I, I'm assuming the people who I'm going to reference don't listen to my podcast <laughs> but if they do hopefully I'll be vague enough but there are guests we've had over the years that we've been obligated to have and you know I've noticed that over the years previous pets have kept their distance a little bit um and I think they very accurately accurately picked up on our feelings about having them stay in our home um, and how well, they did <laughs> tension in the relationship. And so they just kind of kept their distance that or they worked really hard to be nice and affectionate to the guests, I think, to try and improve the energy of the person. Mm -hmm. um, but it's it's been uncanny. It's been really uncanny. So I can tell you another funny story about my dog, Tilly, who is a 20 pounds Lhasa Apsu, a little dog. And a few years back when I work outside of home in the office and I really didn't enjoy and I was born out and the job wasn't making me happy. So we have a fenced in yard and we have doggy dogs so the dogs can go in and out wherever they please as long we're at home. If we leave, we close the doggy door and they have to stay inside. So each morning I was preparing myself to leave the home for work and then I called the dogs inside. Well, very often Tilly was showing me how much I don't want to go to the office, how much I don't enjoy my work and how stressed I was. It happened when I called her, she didn't come. So I call her, she didn't recognize her name, she didn't recognize any comment. As soon as I was outside, she was running in the fence in area with a big smile on her 
face and having the best time in her life. Of course, I was stressed because I had to go to work. So a few times I called to work and I say, you know, I will be late. Of course, I didn't tell it and I cannot catch my dog. <laughs> <laughs> but think about how smart it was from her. Stay home. We can have fun. You don't want to go. So she was doing everything that I would stay home. And 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 it's amazed me because she has never done this again since I quit my job. And of course, how many times I have to leave home and close the doggy door and leave them inside. She has never done it in, again. So now they're they're amazing and uncanny. And I I think your point about how animals pick up what's going on for us, I think in a clearer way than we are aware. Um, it, it, I, f- I found it to be so true. The one thing I want to make sure that I um, clarify for people listening to, because this is so new for a lot of people, is that they're not necessarily understanding exactly the whole nature of the situation, right? It's almost like having, I'm thinking, a toddler who's home and picks up on the fact that you're stressed or you don't like so-and-so or you're saying this or that, but they're not privy to everything. Mm-hmm you know, but they feel the emotions. And even from a purely psychological point of view, like we, I feel like we are responsible for being thoughtful about how we manage our stuff and impact our families, including our pets, you know, and and it's not easy to be perfect. I mean, I, you know, when I'm stressed, you know, they feel it. And is that, the best thing for them? Absolutely not. So it's not about being perfect, but it's about being aware and trying to manage it better. And I think being mindful, like, you know, a few years back when Tilly didn't come inside and was running around the fence in the yard, I didn't connect to that. I was like, I have to be at work and she is not coming. And I was even more stressed. But as soon I call work and I knew I could relax because, okay, they know I will be late. And she was like, okay, let's go inside. (laughs) So it's like, it's just being mindful what we feel and like getting in touch with us with our emotions absolutely so Anna, how could people generally even if they're not feeling particularly intuitive or their intuitive skills haven't yet extended to their communication with their animals how can people communicate more effectively with their animals what are some like do's or don'ts or things that you think people you wish people knew I do feel like we all are very intuitive, but our busy life, our monkey mind doesn't allow us to stop in a moment and receive, like I explained before, like what I'm feeling in my body, what image I'm seeing. And with our own pets, sometimes it's difficult because we know them so well. So we are questioning if this is our brain talking because we know them so well or there's our intuition. But I do feel like, just calming ourselves, being in the present moment. And then you can ask the question and see what what you receive. Could be image, could be world or the feeling in your body. And start with something simple, even like which kind of food would you like to have today? Or do you want to go for a walk or to a doggy park and see what comes in your mind? But I really feel like calming ourselves being present in the moment this is the key yeah and just to support what you're talking about about animals being intuitive and picking up on all kinds of things some of the listeners will be familiar with Rupert Sheldrake a British um, biologist who's quite well known now for um, his research with animals picking up on things intuitively like he has a book dogs that know when their owners are coming home that's a great book if anybody wants to take a look at that but there's actually data showing there's science showing that they do pick up on things and like you said we need to get into a a more mindful and open space so that we can be clear on what they are communicating with us all of the time really um, and so that it's not more like a person with a, a, an object. Mm-hmm. 
Definitely. And and as you know, I always encourage people, talk to your animals. Tell them how you feel. Tell them you are going on vacation or the business trip. You will be in you will be back in two days or the five days. Tell them if something is happening at home or the, the dynamic change because they pick up on our energy, but they don't always know why we feel that way. So I always encourage talk to them like you would talk to a small children. Don't make it big deal, just simple, but let them know what is happening. Absolutely. And something that I, in terms of learning for us, the non animal communicators of the world, which is most people, <laughs> but um, but we want to do better, right? So I something I learned a long time ago or heard from Shalini Bosby Show, again, who we probably known for like 20 years now. But one thing she would always say is um be careful with our language because our language shapes the movies in our minds and our energy. And that's what animals are tuning into. And she would always say, don't, you know, in English, it's so loaded with negatives. So um, don't bark rather than, she said, that's not helpful. Be quiet sends the image that we want from them or be calm, not, you know, stop acting out. You know? <laughs> mm -hmm. So framing in a using positive language that, like you said, is simple and paints a clear picture sounds like it's much easier for an animal to understand what we mean. Yeah, definitely. And like the example you gave, I, I always talk about don't jump on the sofa. The image we are sending is a dog on a sofa or cat on a sofa. But if we say stay on the floor or the stay on the carpet, that's a very different image. You see, that's the animal on the carpet. Absolutely. And honestly, even with a small child, I would recommend to somebody to say, you know, emphasize what you want them to do because <laughs> yeah. it's much clearer to understand. Anna, can you talk a little bit about what it feels like to communicate with an animal who's passed away versus an animal who is in the physical now, like your process or if there's anything that feels different or not? Actually, for me, there is not much difference because they, like I said, I connect with the energy. And even though they're in spirit, I pick up about the personality or the why they passed or the, the illness or the what they enjoy in life. And about, so for me, I don't feel much difference, to be honest. So maybe other communicators feel the difference, but for me, it's not really, not really much. Actually, what I've heard from both people who are formal animal communicators and just other intuitives who can connect with animals or their situations is that, and actually it's it's this way with people too sometimes, it's very hard sometimes to tell if someone you don't know is in a body or not because their energy is still alive. And so it can be hard to tell, you know, I've heard from other people that it can be hard to tell like if an animal is missing, if it's alive or not um because again the consciousness is what you're connecting to and that's still there yeah but very much so and the example you gave is very very good because when animals are missing it's very difficult for us and i speak now in general the talent if the animal is alive or not and we might see a scene from five minutes ago but what is the animal doing now or they're still alive, we don't know because the images of the feeling are still so strong. So that's a very difficult part of animal communication. And I meant to ask you earlier, and I forgot, um, but your journey to becoming a formal animal communicator, you did specific training to sharpen your natural intuitive gifts. Can you talk a little bit about that? So as I mentioned, Ozzy was very hard working on me, showing me the past, showing up, barking, but I didn't know what to do with it. So a few years later, I came across a video that was advertisement for animal communication workshop at Omega Institute. At that time, I didn't know anything about animal communication or the Omega Institute, and I just watched the video. I'm like, mm -hmm. ah. <laughs> <laughs> didn't really do anything for me. 
one week later um, on my computer and I think was on Facebook, the same video pops up and I watch again. And at that moment, I knew I have to go there. And immediately I call Omega with my fingers crossed. They still have spot for me, which they did. And this was a weekend workshop, weekend long workshop of animal communication with Daniel McKinnon. And those few days open a new world for me, like open a new door to like, wow, what is this? Is it possible? Then I signed up for another workshop with Daniel McKinnon, which was in Kripalu, which is like five minutes from my home. So it's like, wow, how convenient. <laughs> and then I started with Daniel for over a year and I become her, one of her certified practitioner. And of course, I took other workshops with different animals, communicators like Dr. Kara Gabin, John Renquet, and Tammy Billips, Dr. Stephen Farmer, everything that is connected with animal communication, intuitive work. I took some classes in mediumship, and recently I attended a medical intuitive with Tina Zion in Omega Institute again. So I feel like I've become a lifelong student of intuitive work. And beside all those great people I'm learning from, there of course, all the animals I'm connecting with because I do feel like I give a reading and I receive a reading because there's always a lesson. There's always something for me as well. Absolutely. And I love that you are talking about, you know, continuing your formal journey of learning because, you know, you are naturally intuitive. Even if you didn't do that, you would still have the ability. But, you know, the practicing, you know, it's key for anything, right? Like if you want to be a great musician versus a very good musician, it's it's the practice and the ongoing um, education. I think it's so great. And and I think it's important that people know that this is a discipline. Um, yeah. And I feel like from everyone, I can learn always something to add my to intuitive toolbox. You know, people have different perspective, different experience, different way of communicating. So I really like to learn this and, and be with the same minded people is amazing too. And, and just a quick note for people, Dr. Stephen Farmer is, the, is one of the people who has animal spirit cards and the books. They're really interesting. And, and the symbolism um, of different animals, he talks a lot about. Um, here's something interesting. I don't know, and you may not have thoughts on this, but lately I've been seeing a series of animals that when I look up the symbol, the symbolism, there's a lot of overlap. Hawks, turkey vultures butterflies um and actually uh, a blue heron and and granted i live in an area where there's a lot of wildlife but the blue heron maybe flew within 15 feet of me twice two and i don't know if it's the same one in two different days two different areas in my neighborhood a turkey vulture flew they never fly that low it must have been 10 12 feet in the air tops and maybe 15 feet in front of me while I was walking my dog Zelda and just a lot of them come in closer. So I feel this is probably a message I'm supposed to get from the universe. And I know about like change, transformation, rebirth, you know, all that. Maybe spreading your wings, opening your wings. Like you mentioned the blue hair, that's a huge boat with a lot of you know the the wings being very long yeah the hawk you mentioned it's like different perspective different point of view but yes absolutely and and i would encourage you also to pay attention like again how did you feel when before you saw that all the different animals or the birds or the where you're pondering on something should I be doing this or the, should I be going there or the, what should I prepare for work or something so there might be a message and especially if the animals come very close to us like we stop for a moment it's like wow this was beautiful the wow this was scary or the you know that we really need to pay attention to yeah, I mean, and you just mentioned that if they come really close, I mean, that's a thing. Turkey vultures don't come that close to people 
you know, I mean, it was it was startling. Same with the blue heron twice. Um, and the butterfly, I mean, really looked like it was going to touch me <laughs> a few times. Um, so I really do think it's kind of like, OK, wake up and pay attention because this, these were atypical things for these animals to do. Or atypical yeah. behaviors. Yeah, I have recently two snakes launching or sunbathing on one of the shrubs in the front of my house. It started with one, then was another one. I'm like, hmm. that's like shedding old belief system, old weight and transformation as well. And because there are two, it's about relationships. So they have been showing up again and again. And I think I do have to some work to do. <laughs> So interesting. And and I want to be mindful of your time, but I keep having these questions pop in my mind. So um, because, you know, again, as I mentioned, I've had deep connections with animals my entire life. They have been more than just animals. I felt that they have been guides, souls that I've known before. Um, I'm wondering if if you can talk a little bit about do we have animals come to us that we have known before in this life or another life where there is an, a soul connection? Definitely there's soul connection. And I feel like we sign a contract, soul contract with our animals who come in our life. And it feels when we have this strong feelings, like you said, like, oh, I saw the animal before, or the, I know the animal so well. I do feel like, yeah, there is something we can learn from it or that they come to our life on purpose. And that's why we have such a strong connection because our souls are connected because they met already somewhere. And that's like a, like a lesson for us. And, and, and I feel the same with people. We meet so many people and some come and go, but some, stay with us you know it doesn't have to be in physical form but in our heart or the mind and we have a strong connection and the same as with animals definitely absolutely i'm laughing because usually princess fights to get in the room with there's a few people i see um for psychotherapy and she if she gets to run downstairs before i shut the upper door she will be meowing and you know clawing at the underside of the door now she's here just kind of sleeping in the corner, not really sleeping, just listening. <laughs> Sometimes she's like jumping on the chair. I thought she might be doing that today. So today I was like, you're allowed to come down today. <laughs> she is part of the show. You talked about her before. <laughs> I know. And honestly, she, I felt a very strong soul connection. I just thought, I know you, I know you. Um, and she, you know, she was looking from the outside of this patio door in and putting her paw there, even though we have other animals. And that's so unusual. She would, like, I have to come in. Um, and, and honestly kept us up for about, you know, well over a year. So. And in situation like this also might be like an animal who is in spirit, but you know, you knew the animal that this was your pet might be sending her because the animal knows you need a new companion or that something is going on in your life. And that's why she came to your life. The situation with my other dog, Luna, who sometimes look like my dog in spirit, Pepper, and I just look at her and I don't see Luna, I see Pepper. And I cannot explain this, but her demeanor, her look is just him. And at that moment, I know. He is visiting. He is there because I see him, <laughs> you know, even though he looks like Luna, if that makes sense. Oh, it does. I mean, honestly, I've said out loud and, you know, some people will get this and some people will be like, all right, this is my last episode of Tracy's podcast because <laughs> it's too out there for me what I'm about to say. But when our cat Petey passed away, you know, it's got to be, I'm going to say, oh God, is it two years ago, two, three years ago? I have to think about it, but I mean, I, I had such a deep soul connection with her and honestly, a, a year on, I still very much missed her and I felt this longing for her. And what's interesting is I was consciously aware of that and princess showed up shortly after her personality and her physical appearance are very similar. 
and the way she very intensely stares into my, like she's clearly communicating something all the time. And um, I, I believe that either Petey is kind of cohabitating with princess and princess's little body or that she sent her because it's uncanny that she does the same very specific things that aren't generally cat-like um, necessarily. But I, I really love that you shed light today on, you know, the the depth of our our animal companions in our worlds and our ability to connect with them and the fact that they are really listening and communicating with us. I guess the very last question is, wild animals have you had experiences with wild animals where you have communicated with them and does that communication feel different it's a little bit different because um when i try to communicate with wildlife i feel like it's approaching someone on the street <laughs> you know if someone comes to you you don't know it's like oh you might talk or do you might say i'm sorry i'm busy and you keep going so the same with with the animals if they come to to my backyard like we have a lot of bears coming and deers and they come again and i feel like they feel comfortable but i would not approach animal who, who might be scared or that is just passing by because I I do respect them and I feel like maybe they don't want to talk. You, you see the difference because our pets are very much connected to our life, to our routine. They, they, are, they are living like a different life than yeah. wildlife. So the response from wildlife is very different in, in from my experience. You know, I, I've been hesitating whether I should ask this question or bring this up because, again, people who may or may not love animals but feel like they're kind of theirs and their objects, again, that are good or bad or pleasing or not, may not get this. But when you were talking about wild animals and how we should be thoughtful about how we approach them, like we would be thoughtful about how we approach a stranger on the street, my thought, you reminded me of the thing is a lot of times I feel like I hear people saying like, oh, they're just going to pick up their cat or dog and hug them because they want the hug, but the animal doesn't necessarily want to. And then it's kind of like trying to restrain the animal from getting away or wanting to have the animal be with them on their terms. You know, as a psychologist, I think about just even with people, we want to have appropriate boundaries and and be mutually respectful and sometimes we might want to hug somebody who doesn't want to be hugged or we might not want to be hugged and I feel like it's important to have that same kind of attunement and respect with our non-human um, neighbors family members and so forth to, to understand that they have their own ways of relating what feels safe and comfortable and what doesn't and to, yeah. that that we as humans really need to be more attuned and honor that. I, you know, do you have any thoughts on that? Oh, absolutely. Like I can talk about my two dogs. Tilly, the little one, is like, Phew, don't touch me. I, I'm just here. I'm beautiful and I need my space. <laughs> and my older dog, Luna, is like all over everyone, us or the if company comes like she has a very different personal space. And if I would start hugging Tilly or kissing, I would do more harm, I'm feeling, because this is not what she wanted. But if she feels like coming close and have affection, she would. And I think we can never forget this. And, and going back to wildlife, if we see a bear, deer, other animal, we're like, hey, I want to take a picture. I want to come close. No, actually, we need to do the opposite. We need to pull our energy and be still and make ourselves smaller. And then the animal will allow us to watch them for longer or that even take a picture. So important. Anna, is there anything that I didn't ask that I should have or that you would like people to know that I that we haven't yet talked about? I'm not sure if we mentioned the connection with animals in spirit because that's something very important. So if anyone who is listening to our conversation hear, feel, see animal who passed, don't think you are crazy because they do come to visit and yeah. Just say thank you for visit, thank you for the sign, and ask them to come again. 
because that's what I get from my clients. I will tell you something, but don't think I'm crazy. I'm like, no, you are not crazy. They send a sign. So please believe and accept this. They, they are in connect with us. I love that. I keep having more questions and I feel like I, I <laughs> it might be driving our listeners crazy and, and keeping you. But one of the things I think is most difficult for people is when an animal is ill or when an animal is either needing help leaving their bodies, passing away, and so forth. And is there anything animals would like us to know about that? Or is there anything you would like us to know about dealing with an animal who's very ill or you know, making the decision and so forth? That's a very difficult time because we want to keep our animals as long as possible. But I think we have to be very mindful, like, what is the best for the animal? And it feels to me like we need to make the very selfless decision of sometimes letting them go because they're in pain or the discomfort. And there's not really anything we can do or the doctors to extend the life, a quality life. And I do feel like all of the animals I spoke with gave a sign, gave a something that was the time. If we are talking about animal who is ill for a long time, they will give us a sign, either a look or the touch with a paw. Usually the people understand the sign, but then again, they question themselves, but the animals will give the sign. And I think people also should know the animals orchestrate when they leave us. So we never are too late. We never are too, you know, like we blame ourselves. Like I blame myself with Aussie. Like, oh, I didn't know anything. Why? Why? She didn't want me to know. Because at that time, there was a lot of things going on in my life and I was fighting some illness as well. So she chose the way that didn't make any problem for me, if that makes sense. Even though it was very difficult for me, but it was her way of choosing the best way to to exit my life and then stay with me and teach and show me my my path to animal communication. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And you and again you can see I'm very moved by what you're saying, you know, having been down that road and and I I feel so privileged um, for, you know, knowing about this. There's so much more to our animals and our life with them and their spirits and, you know, this world in general. And I feel so privileged to have met you and that you agreed to come on the the podcast, truly, because I think this is going to be so helpful for so many people to know, um, because we can always like you said, continue learning and open our hearts and do better. Um, so I, I really thank you so much. Where can people learn more about you if they want to find more out about you and your work and how to connect with you? Um, I would invite everyone to go to my website, which is annaklocker.com, A N N. A-N-N-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com. I also have a Facebook and Instagram with the same name, Anna Kloka Intuitive. And I'm just starting on TikTok, which is not <laughs> my biggest <laughs> I'm, I'm taking baby steps there, but definitely on my website, on Facebook and Instagram. I love it. Well, Anna, thank you so much for making time to be with me today and to be on the podcast and to share your wonderful insights and gifts with our listeners. This has been another episode of Unpacking Possibility. If you enjoyed the show, please remember to like, share, follow. Um, and until next time, um, hug your pets, but don't hug them if they don't want to be hugged <laughs> and um, be well. 